Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 535 of the podcast and it is Thursday 26th of February 2021 as I record this. So in today's special in between episode, I'm talking to lit RPG author Paul Bello on how authors can use AI writing tools like GPT-3 and what is the best way to prompt the models to output usable text, which believe me is a challenge, <laughs> and are there copyright issues with this approach? Paul explains how he is using the tools and how we need to embrace the possibilities rather than reject them. So that is coming up in the interview. And we actually recorded the session a few weeks ago before I got access to GPT-3, but now I have it. So I have been playing around with it. And Paul's tips were really useful in creating the right kind of prompts that generated output. And I've actually been having fun with it. Like I, I'm not a gamer, but it is fun like a game. And it's a challenge to think up prompts that output useful text. I'm not specifically using it for any writing project. In fact, I am deliberately avoiding using it for any specific work that I intend to publish or submit to competition or any of that. I'm being really careful. (laughs) I'm just playing with it uh, because I still feel like there are some issues that need to be worked out. But as I discussed with Paul, it's definitely a tool right now. Uh, As in, you don't click a button and out spits a finished article or a chapter or a story. You have to prompt it and control it by your own words. And I was thinking, trying to think of a metaphor, because I feel like many authors are resisting this because they think it's like, click a button and there's a finished book. That is not it at all. Uh, So it's a bit like a car. So it's sitting there and it doesn't go anywhere until you tell it where to go. And then you are driving it and you have to keep adjusting the wheel along the way. And it's useful, but it takes control and direction and purpose from a human. And as we've seen with the idea of self-driving cars, it that's been under development for many years now and there's still so many challenges and I feel like this is something similar there's lots of useful applications but we're not at the point where it's just click a button and everything works so my overarching feeling is that on its own GPT-3 right now is not much use to the average author it's not something that uh, you know, will change your life. <laughs> but the tools being built on top of it will be very interesting indeed, particularly the specific models for the genres and the more powerful ones that are inevitably coming. For example, Paul himself uh, talks about his own lit RPG adventures, which helps with world building. And that is built on top of GPT-3. And I think that's more useful if you write in that genre or you write fantasy, you can use that to generate characters and all this kind of thing, world building stuff. And uh, also thriller author Andrew Main, so more in my genre, has built AI channels on top of uh, GPT-3 a platform that enables people to collaborate with artificial intelligence agents along with their friends and co-workers in a social app. And that has more genre-specific channels like vampires and comics and HG Wells, sci-fi and more. So I'll link to all that in the show notes and you can find more AI writing tools, including those built on top of GPT-3 for fiction, non-fiction, emails, content marketing and ads at thecreativepen.com forward slash AI writing. We also reference some of the discussions from my short book, Artificial Intelligence, Blockchain and Virtual Worlds, the impact of converging technologies on the publishing on authors and the publishing industry, which is available in audiobook as well as ebook and print. You can also listen to selected chapters um, in podcast episodes 518, 19 and 520. And you can find all these AI and futurist related episodes linked at thecreativepen.com forward slash future. 
because I'm starting to get quite a lot of them now. I'm quite thrilled about it. So thanks to all my patrons for supporting these extra shows on AI and converging technologies. You guys really do fund my brain and time to think about this stuff and for these extra episodes, which I'm I'm not using any advertising on. So if you'd like to support the show and receive my extra monthly Q&A audio, just go to patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. So here's the interview with Paul and stick around for my concluding comments at the end of the episode. Paul Bello is a lit RPG author. He's also the publisher of Lit RPG Forum, Lit RPG Reads, and Lit RPG Adventures. A writer for over four decades, he's currently tinkering with GPT-3 to create tools for authors and help his own writing too. So welcome to the show, Paul. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Oh, I am so excited to talk to you today. And as I was saying before, like you've really helped me shift my own mindset around this kind of AI writing. And we're going to get into so much today. But first up, just tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. And also, what is Lit RPG for anyone who might not know? Okay, I'll start with the Lit RPG first. It's basically a genre. The term was coined back in 2010, I believe, by Russian authors that were putting out a anthology. And stories of this type, the basic trope being uh, you're trapped in a video game or real people going inside a video game has been around uh, since at least uh, 1978, I think, with Quag Keep by Andre Norton. And uh, that's a story of some uh, tabletop role players that get transported into their game world. It was probably around 2015 or so that American authors were a little bit fed up with having to read translated works from Russian to English, (laughs) which uh, caused some problems sometimes. So they figured, "I I can write this. I'm a gamer. And thus began the American lit RPG scene. I missed the uh, the first year, 2015, 2016. It was late 2016. I was writing romance under a pen name at the time. And that's basically when I discovered the genre. And I went all in creating my community website at Lit RPG Forum. I did a blog and so on. And then I was writing books uh, in the genre. And I kind of got sidetracked with some video games and then this AI stuff. I started writing uh, personally in the fourth grade. I was, Pac-Man was big in the 80s. And I was actually writing a Pac-Man fan fiction where he goes on a time travel adventure. And my uh, fourth grade teacher was so impressed that she helped me bind you know, the story into a book with, uh, I think we used a yarn and the whole punch pages and whatnot. I, I wish I still had that, but I lost it in the the last 40 years some, during one of my moves or something. But I, that kind of kicked off my joy of writing. I grew up in a household where my father read a lot of science fiction. And uh, before he traded those in, I would go through those and read them and whatnot. So over the years, I kind of got interested in technology too. And I've always had in the back of my mind, what if there was an AI tool that could help my writing? (laughs) (laughs) And I I did a lot of research on various, various ideas that have people have had over the years for uh, natural language generation. Most of the ones I looked up from the 80s and were written in dead languages, uh, computer languages that that aren't even available anymore. I couldn't really test or do anything on my own. And then it was 2019 that GPT-2 came out and I kind of read about it and I got it up and running on a cloud server And I fed it, I think there's a data set of 170 megabytes of old science fiction pulp stories. And I I trained GPT-2 on that. And then I was playing around with other things. That's how I actually stumbled across Janelle. She's really big in the AI space. And she did a blog post on using AI to create uh, D&D character backstories. Janelle Shane, I think you're talking about. Who's yes, got, yes, yes. Yeah, who's got a great uh, blog, but her book is You Look Like a Thing and I Love You, which is uh, fantastic, uh, that talks a bit about this and was was written around the sort of GPT-2 time, which I think was 2019. But you've used some terms there that people might not understand. So can, can you just talk about what GPT-2, what GPT-3 now is, in case people haven't really come across 
CrossFit? Yeah, basically it stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer Version 3. And basically it's a language model that uses a neural net. They basically read, quote unquote, a whole bunch of data, written words, and then it, it comes up with kind of a matrix where it's able to guess based on all of the content that it's read, what what word is going to come next in a sequence. I don't know if that helps any or <laughs> makes yeah, it more so, confusing. So essentially, yeah, so essentially it is a kind of massive autocomplete based on a data set. So you mentioned there a data set of science fiction novels, but I believe GPT-3's data set is essentially the whole of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of Reddit in there. I think they did some fiction novels. Now, the cool thing about GPT-2 was that you could fine tune it. They have their general model that's just built on all the text of the internet. You could fine tune it on a smaller data set, say just fiction. Or what I did was I just trained it on uh, D&D character backstories and then if you fine tune it, it becomes even better. Now, the problem with GPT-3 is that it's so big, there's no way that I can fine tune it on my own. And uh, they're not allowing everybody to do that yet. Just the people that are the projects that are bigger and have a, a wide audience and stuff like that. So mm. that's uh, something I definitely want to look to in the future is actually fine tuning GPT-3. Uh, to get it even better at e either writing fiction or the D and D character backstories, because yeah, right definitely. now when I was setting up Lit RPG Adventures, which is basically a a series of generators that creates a D and D character backstories, it does magic items, cities, taverns, it generates all these stuff for world building. What I had to do was actually write out a whole bunch of examples. GPT three it works works on a, a system um, where you can either give it a zero shot. That means you basically just tell it, give me a list of 10 funny names for movies, and it would list them out. You can do a one shot where you give uh, GPT-3 one example. Uh, here is a character backstory. Write me a new one. What I've found for the longer text, usually you want to do a two shot or even three shot where you give it two or three different examples, and then it's able to better recreate what you've shown it with the examples. We're going to get into some more how do we use it things in a minute, but I just want to take it up a level because I've had people email me and say, why would you even bother using these tools? You're not a real writer if you're going to use AI. So what do you think about the mindset we need to approach this with? Yeah, I've run into a little bit of the same. I think people are just worried right now that AI is going to take over completely. There will be no more you know, need for writers or anything like that. But I personally think that we have at least another five or 10 years uh, before the AI evolves enough that it's able to do a novel or even a short story on its own. So I, I think over the next five or 10 years, you're going to see a, a merging of human creativity with enhanced by AI tools. And that's how I see GPT-3. It's not like some magic button where I just press it and I get a thousand words of perfectly clean text. It's more of a, I, I guide GPT-3 along and it's more of a productivity tool, I think, at this point. Mm, I totally agree. I've tried a number of the tools that are based on it. And I, this is really what I wanted to talk to you about is how do we basically talk to the machine? How do we talk to GPT-3 or these tools to get the best thing out of it? So you mentioned there a list or a one shot or a two shot. So can we get into that in a bit more detail? Because for example, say I, you know, like you've mentioned character backstories and I've had a go at your lit RPG one. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I can get this whole backstory to a character and that's something that I personally struggle with my characters I write thrillers so how much backstory do I really need this is moving forward really fast and all this stuff so that's something I'm really interested in but if, if I do have access to GPT-3 or I use a different tool what would I type in order to get the type of thing I want basically what you're talking about is what we're calling a prompt basically you feed a prompt into GPT-3 and then it gives output based on that. So I've been using it different ways for the character backstories. Like I said, I give it 
basically two, sometimes three examples. And then it's just able to look at those two examples, base it on the gigabytes of data that it's uh, ingested, and it comes out with a, a really good copy of it, it comes down to the old computer term to uh, garbage in garbage out you really have to be careful with with the prompts because sometimes it can go you know a little crazy if the prompt is off a little bit now for writing fiction there's a couple tools that are pretty interesting and will probably improve in in the future but i've been just using the playground application on the open ai website and basically, that's just a big text box where you can type in a prompt, hit the button, and then you get a output. So how I'm using it is I usually set up a prompt with what I'm writing. So that will be things like uh, the characters in the scene, a little, uh, little bit of an outline of what I want to be in this chapter. And then usually I will write about 100 to maybe 300 words on my own. And then by giving GPT-3 about 500 words of a prompt, I can just hit the button and it will continue writing the story using whatever I gave it. One of the things I notice is that if you don't list the characters, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> GPT-3 will just introduce George. Oh, George walked. In. Who's George? Wait a minute. <laughs> So you really do have to watch it. And uh, this is probably going to improve in the future as more specific author tools come on the market. But for now, it's just, it's basically been able to double my word output for the day, okay, which well, is pretty... We'll, we'll come back to that because that everyone's going, yes. But I just <laughs> want to come back on the prompt because I really want to be specific because this is what I found when I first went in there. So I'm not a programmer. You're, you're obviously a programmer, so you're more technical, but you don't need to be a programmer to use these tools. As you say, you're typing in English, just some prompts. But what you're saying is I don't write who is Joe question mark and then expect it to come up with a story or anything, I might have to say Joe met Paul down the pub and they had a drink and then they opened the box and found right. and then hit enter or whatever. Yeah, that's one thing I found is that I really have no problem with the writer's block anymore. So if I got to a place where I'm not sure what's going to happen, I'll just hit the AI button and I might not agree with what direction it takes me in, but sometimes it has some really good ideas. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And I think that's what I found really interesting. They actually have a slider where you can make it not imagine, it's not imagination. You can make it more creative as in more unusual, or you can make it less creative and less unusual. So really more standard. What I've done is copy and paste like a hundred words of one of my stories in, and then uh, just press, you know, continue. And what it's generated with the more unusual one, I guess a bit like what some of Janelle Shane's done, is some metaphors and some language that I've been sort of stunned by in a way, as in things yeah. that I never would have thought of because it's so different to the way I think. And that, so that I think is what I'm interested in is using it for prompts, almost prompting back to me almost. When you said it has uh, doubled your word output, I think the, the question people have is, are you just, you're putting this stuff in, are you just copying and pasting those lines and that's it? I kind of got a process because we don't have tools yet and I haven't had time to build one on my own. But basically you have this text box on the website and there is what's known as a context window of 2000 tokens. And because of the way they break down words, individual words, that's actually 2000 tokens is actually about 1600 words. So you have to limit your prompt and the output can't be more than the 2000 tokens. What I usually do is try to have at least five to 700 words of a prompt for the fiction writing and then usually only have it create maybe 50 to 100 words at a time. This did start to get a little expensive. I think last month I spent $110 and I was able to write, I think, about 120,000 words in the month. The pricing is, is not that bad, but I think it will come down in the future. 
Yes, and there are lots of sites now being built on top of GPT-3, which are the ones that most people will be able to get access to, because, of course, at the moment, it's still in closed beta. But it, again, just on those words, so once once it's generated a couple of hundred words, are you copying those words and pasting them into your manuscript and just publishing it like that? Or No, no. You, so yeah. what I'll do is I will, once it gets to the 2000 context window, I'll go back to the top. I will keep my scene outline and character list and stuff like that. But then I will delete, uh, copy, cut out maybe 500 words and put that into a Word document. And then that opens the context window on GPT-3. And it has all the other content that it wrote, plus my description of the scene and whatnot. And then you hit the button again and you, and you keep writing with my writing and the AI kind of merging together, but it does need editing at the end. That's a good point. I have tried to sneak one or two small things out on another uh, pen name just to see how they would be accepted. But like anything in writing, it really comes down to that uh, the second draft, third draft, fourth draft. But GPT-3 really helps with that first draft and really banging through, making sure you don't get stopped or or blocked or anything like that. So even as a an idea generator, so for example, I, I did one prompt. There's a, a basically Thomas is in the graveyard and he's digging into the ground and he finds a box and then he opens the box and finds. And then you you hit enter and it comes up with whatever it comes up with. And then right, you just right. you can just do it again and again. And every single time it's going to come up with something different, some of which will be ridiculous and some of which might be interesting. And as you say, it's ideas that might be interesting. And I did have a couple of times where it did come out with text I could have just copied and pasted on its own because it made sense. But uh -huh. that's I don't think that's how most people are going to use it really. As you say, it's more like a tool for helping you come up with ideas and move on to the next phase, I guess, at the moment exactly. anyway. Exactly. Now I did uh, use it. I am working on my next novel called uh, Shadow Ranger. And he's trapped in a video game that's a cheap knockoff of a popular game. And it has to do with guilds. And I, I could have spent, and, and it would have been fun too, coming up with guild names and attributes of these guilds. But what I did was just write maybe three or four of them and put that as a prompt and hit the enter button on GPT-3. And it suddenly spit out 200 guilds. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of them were great, but some of them were pretty hilarious or clever, or the name had to do with what the guild was about and stuff like that. It's a really good tool I found for at least me and Lit RPG for generating treasures and describing monsters and stuff like that. So... I think it's more good on the smaller tasks right now rather than a big project just because of the 2000 token character limit. And when you want to generate a list, are you literally just entering a list? So if I put Joe and then on the next line, Paul and the next line, Mary and the next line, Fred, is, and then hit enter, is it going to carry on generating a list of names, for example? Usually, but what I did is I put the following as a list of 20 fantasy elf names for male rangers. And then I do like maybe one uh, parentheses and a name, two parentheses and a name, three parentheses, and then just stop. And then by telling it, the following is a list of what you want a list of. Sometimes it can infer with, okay, a, this is going to be a list of names because the first two are Paul and John. But if you give it a little more, like these are fantasy elf names, I find it, it's a little better at understanding exactly what you want. Oh, and that's really helpful to me. It's so what I find really interesting is that I I know how to use Google to find mm -hmm. what I want. And I think we know how to do that now. Although it's funny because my mum, who's mid 70s, will sometimes not use Google in a way that I think makes sense. It's ha why aren't you using this tool properly? And I feel <laughs> at the moment when I'm playing with these various tools, I'm like, why can't I use this properly? Why am I not getting it? Which is why I wanted to talk to you. And it, you've used the word fun and double word output and Yudan Jaya who's been on the show also used the word joy and I think this is what's so cool it's actually fun it's playing a game and I'm not a gamer but I'm getting a 
kind of gaming idea when I'm playing with this stuff. And so uh, that to me is what's important. But some people are saying, isn't this cheating? <laughs> what do you think about the cheating thing? I would ask them if they hand write all of their manuscripts or if they use a typewriter or if they use modern word processor. In some ways, I think GPT-3 can be viewed as basically an enhanced word processor. I know Google Docs right now, they have a feature built in where it will, if you're typing something, it'll give a one or two word suggestion sometimes, and you Mm. just have to hit tab and it will auto complete that. I I think that is going to be built into more tools as we move forward. I know OpenAI just signed a big uh, contract with Microsoft And of course, Microsoft has Word and all the other fun programs that they have. So I'm wondering, I'm thinking that probably this year, GPT-3 will be rolled into a product like Word, where you can basically access the power of GPT-3 through a normal word processor. Yeah, I completely agree with you. There is no way Microsoft did this big deal. It was like a billion dollars or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of money to essentially be able to use GPT-3. And presumably we had two and then three a year later. Maybe we're going to have four this year or whatever it is, GPT-X will go into the the Microsoft suite of tools. And it's funny because it's enough to make me consider going back into Microsoft. I've been Mac for for years, (laughs) but now I'm like, oh, does that mean I'll need a PC to kind of access this (laughs) stuff? Which kind of is scary, but there you go. But I did want to come back on one question around copyright or two questions about copyright. So I see that people have uh, issues from two angles. So the first one is, obviously, the model is trained on data. Now, the assumption is that the data is publicly available and therefore is not under copyright, but I just can't see how there isn't some breach of copyright somewhere in that model. It just seems impossible to avoid. So that's one thing, the data that's fed in. And the second one is the stuff that comes out. Do you have the right to publish and to own the words that come out of GPT-3 or any of the other tools? So what do you think about these two, the data that it's trained on and the stuff that comes out? Oh, for the data that it's trained on, I did a little research on this. And I don't know if you remember, Google got into trouble a few years back when they decided to go to all the libraries and scan every single book ever made Mm. into the cloud. Mm. And they weren't worrying about copyright or anything, or if people wanted their book to be sucked up into this database that they were building. I think they eventually used it for their book search website. But they got sued and it went back and forth and went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled on Google's side, which basically set a precedent for AI being used for not generative, but NLP, natural language processing. They sided with Google. Now, if that's going to change in the future, I don't know. It's something I will definitely be watching closely. Now, for the generative side, I know OpenAI had uh, some really loose language in their agreement that you had to sign when uh, getting access to the tool, but they listened to the community and changed that. So basically, anything I create with GPT-3, according to them, I own the copyright. And personally, I would think that with all the editing and input that I have to put into the works. Uh, Like I said, it's not just pressing a button and getting something out. I I don't feel bad for saying that I own the copyright of something that I wrote using this tool. It'd be the same as saying, does Microsoft own your word because you used, you know, Microsoft Word to write it? That kind of deal. Yeah. And that's, I think that's where my position has changed from maybe even uh, three months ago where I was really thinking that uh, this there just had to be more problems with it. But as I have got into some of the World Intellectual Property Organization's material and the UK government, which is very pro wanting to do more with AI and attending AI seminars and reading books, and I have also come to this feeling that, yes, I would like to license my work, 
I loved your uh, blockchain idea. Yeah, I, I have listened to some of your podcasts. Yeah, and the idea with that is that, let's say, I'm not in the same genre as you, but I gave the example of what if lots of indie thriller writers created a data set that we called Indie Thriller Writers 2021, and then we were able to license that data set to people. Like you talked about tuning the GPT-3. If we could get paid for li- our licensing our data, that would be one thing. But I don't, and I had suggested, yeah, as you say, using the blockchain to get a percentage of the output. But I'm now with more with you on this in that I feel that what comes out is not going to be just click and publish. And right. maybe it never will be. And that's not how we create anyway. Like we're, we're writers because we enjoy creating. And even the very first thing you must do, which is you have to put in a prompt. It's not click a button and anything's going to happen. You have to prompt this machine to do something. So the initial spark is always from you. And then, as you say, you're going to edit it and shape it and turn it into something else. Yeah. Do you, do you think we'll be able to license our data to kind of tune things in the future? I don't know. I mean, that barn door might already be open. You know what I mean? Yeah, that is how I feel. Anyone could obviously suck our books out of wherever and use them without us knowing. Okay, is there anything else that you think people need to know like what where are we right now and where do you think people are going to be within the next year how is this going to become more easily accessible for writers and how long will it take it scares me that i'm saying this but i think microsoft might actually help with this (laughs) (laughs) who would have thought (laughs) Yeah, they have the infrastructure and everything to get this out to the people, I think. From what I've heard, there was 250,000 people that applied for GPT-3. And I was one of maybe 1,500 that got access. And what I did basically was showed them all the work that I had done on GPT-2, creating mm. my own data sets and stuff like that. But I, from what I hear, they're going to be opening up access a little more this year. So I'm not sure if it's going to happen this month or next month, but I think Open Open AI is going to release their tool to more people. And then, like I said, hopefully Microsoft will use what they've built up over the years to get this out to more people too. And if people are interested, if you just go to openai.com, you can actually apply for the beta and it's just a a form that you fill in. But I I also wondered about, uh, I read about this thing called GPT Neo from an open source group called Eleuther.ai who've got some funding. And the problem of building these kind of things is that it's incredibly expensive to to train. Millions and millions of dollars, yeah. So I have read about some technical possible solutions that don't involve training it with so much data. So is it just, are we just going to be exploding with possibilities by this time next year? I I think so. Because interesting, you bring up the smaller models, because in some of my tests, the smaller models did perfectly fine on GPT-2, as long as you fine-tuned them with hundreds of megabytes of examples of fiction, or I didn't, I think I only had two or three megabytes of character backstories, but even that was enough to get it able to figure out exactly what I wanted. So there's a future, I think, in the smaller models, and then them actually open sourcing a, a tool is really neat. And then I don't know if you heard, but Google, I think last week or the week before announced they have a model that is, I think, 20 or 30 times bigger than GPT-3. I think Um, it was six times, but that's still a lot. (laughs) Yeah, we're talking a, it was over a trillion, not synapses, but connections in the neural net. And if you think about human beings, I think we have multiple trillions of synapses in our brains. But as these models get larger, it's going to be interesting to see how much the output actually improves. But in the meantime, I think there's going to be other companies uh, like the one you mentioned and others that are coming out with smaller models that are easier to manage, but can do just as good output depending on what exactly what task that you want the, the AI to do. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, uh, so we're recording this in February 2021. And I'm in my mid 40s. And I certainly expect to be doing this for 
let's hope another 45 years at least. We're definitely saying, and you mentioned five to 10 years, but even if it's 20 years, it's still within our creative lifetimes that this stuff is going to become pretty extraordinary. At the same time, we've got AI translation getting better and better. And I know what I feel the fear of people and in a way myself is that we've had so many problems with Kindle in particular being swamped by bad quality work or badly translated work or work that drowns out the voices of other writers. How much more will this happen if people can generate books or auto-translate books very quickly? So given that I expect that to absolutely happen, (laughs) how can we differentiate ourselves and use these tools in a way that help us be more creative and make more money in a sort of abundant creative world? One of the interesting things about uh, GPT-2 was that it was able, since you could create text with it, you could reverse engineer that and discover if text was written with GPT-2 or not, because the basically the words used, the probability of the words being used would match up and you could tell if it was machine generated. And this is why I think that authors are going to be an integral part of the process for, you know, the next five, 10, 20 years is that I I I think it would be easy for Amazon to automate something to have a quality control gate maybe. But even without AI, the market on Amazon has been growing. I started back in 2012 and that wasn't even the golden age of Kindle publishing. I missed it by X number of years. But since then, we've had more and more people putting content on Amazon. There's good things to that, but then there's also bad things, like you said, is that a lot of garbage gets through and it becomes harder and harder for people to find good quality content. And that's where I think AI might help too. But just the idea of using uh, AI to analyze a text and say, okay, if you liked Paul Bellow's Tower of Gates book, you will probably also X, Y, and Z. And that's not based on sales data or anything like that. It would be based upon the basically the genome snapshot of a book is really similar to this other book. I think it's going to come down to Amazon working to be the gatekeeper, but I'm not sure if they, if I see that happening because they basically took down the gateway when they opened up, you know, online publishing. Yeah, exactly. But it may be that curation task is increasingly done by some of the other sites as we find now, like BookBub, you can't always get on BookBub, for example. And I've actually been saying for probably a decade that the book itself should be metadata. We have to type in these categories and keywords and this type of stuff when, why do we have to do that? Like you should be, if you upload the text of your book, the text of the book should be your metadata. That should be the thing. And I think what you're saying there is that might be possible in a more AI driven discoverability space where it can almost parse the emotional journey and the tone and everything within the book and match it to people even more effectively than we do now. So I'm actually looking forward to that because I don't want to enter categories and keywords anymore. Exactly. (laughs) And and that means too, that the good content is going to rise to the top, which I think Amazon wants that cream at the top, give everybody access to publish. Not everybody is going to sell on Amazon. Yeah, and that's, and I that's think certainly the, true now. <laughs> yeah, and I think as the discoverability tools improve in quality, I think that's the next big uh, thing in self-publishing is going to be not the creation side, but the deciding what books a person should read next or recommendation engine, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. We live in very exciting times. So where can people find you and everything you do online? Right now, I'm usually found on litrpgforum.com. That's been running, I think, three or four years now. And we got about a thousand members signed up. And then I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Discord. But if you go to Lit RPG Forum, sign up. If you have any questions or want to pick my brain a little bit, you can do that. And I will likely find you there. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Paul. That was great. Thank you. 
So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Paul and that it gave you some things to think about. I also want to come back to thriller author Andrew Main, uh, who I mentioned in the intro, who has developed this AI channels uh, app and who works with OpenAI on creative things. And he is, a, I read his books as a, as a reader and he's in my niche. So uh, he's got, a, on his blog, he has a blog post that says, AI will write a novel, not yet, but at some point. And quoting from his blog post, which I'll link in the show notes, will they be good novels? Probably not at first. Humans write millions of books every year and most of them are of questionable quality. My first unpublished stories weren't very good. Eventually they'll get better and then they'll get faster at getting better. In time, I'm sure an AI will write a better Andrew Main novel than I can. I don't think this has to be a creative apocalypse. An Andrew Main novel a decade from now might mean a book where I chose the topic and then supervised an AI that created the book. In fact, our concept of a book may change as well. And I think this is exactly the point. And I love that. um, I love finding another thriller author who's excited about this. And yeah, as he said, it is not a creative apocalypse. He says, even when working with the AI, it might generate an audio drama, um, a movie with digital actors, um, that the book could be so much more, it could be a completely immersive experience. And uh, he, he says, I think AI is going to upend everything in entertainment, and not just my little corner of publishing. But no matter how advanced the technology, we're still going to want some of the things we enjoy to have made being made by humans. And this is what I feel too. And I feel like there'll be more of a stratification. Uh, in fact, we can see this already in the sort of artisan movement, the maker movement, the rise in people wanting, for example, an artisan loaf of bread and, you know, a sourdough made by a local baker instead of sourdough put in the supermarket made by a machine or people wanting, um, you know, like a handmade mug um, made by someone on a potter's wheel, for example, as opposed to one made in a factory. And sure, you might have in your cupboard, if you look in your cupboard, maybe you have most of your mugs are made in a factory. Um, And I was just thinking about this because one of my, the mug that I drink tea out of every afternoon is a handmade mug. And, um, but the one I drink my coffee out of is one made in a factory. And so I think this is what it's going to be like. We will uh, consume mass market media and books and maybe by AI, we don't even know. As I've said before, how many of the authors do you read now that you actually know are human? I mean, do you know them? You probably don't know them. (laughs) So, I mean, we just don't know, right? And there are starting to be AI avatars on Instagram, you know, AI models and all of this kind of thing. So I think what we'll have is these, um, it will be a sort of stamp of artisan made by a human. And maybe we'll be doing these limited edition things around, you know, handwritten by humans on handmade paper, very expensive limited edition products versus a mass market edition thing and everything in between. So I'm definitely a glass half full person. You guys know this by now. My career could not have existed without the internet. And sure, I could have written a book, but I could not be reaching you with these words. I I could not be podcasting. I could not be running a business as an author myself online. I mean, it would, well, I could, but it would have been much harder. Uh, I could not reach readers globally through mobile phones. There is so much that I do now that is reliant on technology that's been developed in the last 20 years. So what I see is in the next decade, we're going to be using technologies to transform our process into something that will look quite different as being an author in the 2020s is quite different to being an author at the cusp of the 2010s. So uh, yeah, I think it's a very, very exciting time. And I know I call it futurist. It is futurist because if you do get access to GPT-3, you can apply for access. Uh, You will see it's not going to be like, oh, this is easy. You still have to work pretty hard at prompting the thing. (laughs) So much so that I'm like, yeah, I think I'll wait for the next level of tools. 
Right. Anyway, if you enjoyed this episode, you can find all the AI related episodes and the futurist stuff and book recommendations at thecreativepen.com forward slash future. And please consider supporting the show with just a couple of dollars a month at patreon.com forward slash thecreativepen. So back to the normal show on Monday when I'll be talking to Patrick O'Donnell from Cops and Writers on how to write authentic crime. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>